So welcome Edward and Eddie Sahakian from Davidoff of London. It's a pleasure to have you back in my little store down the road from you. And um, I was trying to think when we first met, but I've given up. <laughs> it was a long time ago, Edward. Major, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting us in this lovely corner here. It's surrounded by these beautiful well, cigars behind and the lovely drinks around us, but most of all, the company. Thank you. Uh, how did we meet? We've been trying to work that out uh, in our trade. We get to meet so many lovely people in the course of years that we lose track of it. Uh, my other excuse is, of course, with my age, I do forget things even more frequently. But I, I want to, again, extend a very warm welcome to you and to your establishment into St. James's Street. It reminds me, takes me back to the days when I was opening a shop in German, in St. James's Street and corner of German Street, uh, when I had a visit from then a very well-established neighbor. Uh, it was uh, John, John Crowley, who owned uh, uh, it was Robert Lewis then, now it's called Fox's, and that shop had been there for many, many years before me. Matter of fact, I used to even buy cigars from there from time to time. And one day whilst uh, we were getting the shop ready, uh, it was late at night, it was probably about 10 o'clock at night, all the workers had gone. It was the last few days of the shop being prepared to be opened up. And I saw a group of about four or five gentlemen walking by, and one of them, I recognized it was John, and he sort of was looking inside. I was vacuuming the floor. You know, I wanted to make sure everything is perfect. And I saw him, I waved at him, and he waved at me. So I opened the door, I said, John, how nice, what are you doing here at 10 o'clock at night? So said, well, we just had a board meeting. These are the members of my board. He had some family that lived in Italy that had come over. And uh, he said, what are you doing here? I said, well, we're preparing the shop to be opened. Yeah, it looks like a very nice shop. I said, would you like to see the inside? He was not expecting that. He was not expecting it at all. He said, are you sure? So would you like me to come in? I said, I'd love to. Please come in. I welcomed him, showed him the shop, upstairs, downstairs, uh, everything. And then he looked around about... Half an hour later, as he was leaving, he extended his hand, said, Edward, I welcome you. I wish you success, but not too much of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like to extend my hand to you, welcome you, and wish you all the success. The more success you have, the more success the trade will have, more success we will all have. Thank, Thank you. you. That's, that's for sure, and thanks for the lovely bottle of champagne after we opened. Um, that didn't last very long, but it went down very well. I think it was your trademark Paul Roger champagne, if I remember yes, rightly. Yes, Winston Churchill's um, champagne of choice. Yes. So that was lovely, and it was great to finally arrive here and add to cigar land of St. James's, which it really is now. Um, we've got four cigar stores up and down the street, so I think it makes us the sort of epicentre for the cigar world in London in the UK. Like how yes. it was in the glorious days of the St. James's area. Remember when before I opened the shop there was Robert Lewis down the road that was one shop then on German Street we had the Dunhill shop the original of real Dunhill shop the upstairs used to have the smoke there it was the shop where it got bombed during the war and the famous story where the manager of the store Two o'clock in the morning, calls the prime minister's office to the secretary. He says, yes, what's happened? Says, Can you please let uh, the prime minister know that uh, a bomb fell on our store? However, his cigars are safe. <laughs> <laughs> Good story, true story. Then further down from there, there was the Sheraton shop. They only sold pipes, but again, it was a very prominent shop. And further down, there was another shop. I never forget. I never remember the name. It was more or less opposite the church. Right. On German Street. And further down, it was uh, Freiburg and Treyer, end of German Street, uh, on the opposite side. Uh, they still kept the facade of the shop now, but it's not a tobacconist anymore. Then, uh, within short walking distance, 
Do you remember in Old Bond Street? Yeah. There was Benson and Hedges. Absolutely. And further round was JJ Fox, where I bought my oh, first JJ Fox. JJ Fox, absolutely, yes. Uh, where was that? On Bond Street? Yeah. On oh, top well, of the uh, Burlington Arcade, where oh, really? Ferragamo shop, shop is now. Yeah, yeah. But it was a lovely shop. It was a little shop with a basement. There. That's right. Yeah. And, and I illegally bought my first box of cigars there at about 14, <laughs> if I remember rightly. <laughs> the gentleman who ran it was Tony Anderson. Oh, he was another character, Tony. Before my time. Uh, uh, it was long before your time. He passed away uh, uh, long, long before that. And also on St. James's Street, if you go much further back, were the biggest cigar merchants I think there were ever in the UK, Salmon and Gluckstein. They had one of their stores, but I think you're going back very pre-war. Would it have been in one of the sites, or in the Park Place, or St. James's Street, I or I think it was on St. James's Street. I've got their whole or history. Or Little St. James's Street, something like that. Possibly. Somebody mentioned that to me. Possibly. They had tons of shops at one yeah. stage, but way before our era. But I'm trying to model my business on theirs in a different yeah. generation. Was there not a Freeman, uh, you know, of the Freeman's family? Was there not a Freeman on Piccadilly at one point? Because I, I came across a box of cigars going back, you know, 60, 70 years. And the address was Freeman, I think Freeman and Co, perhaps. Oh, possibly. Uh, and it was a Piccadilly Gemma. address. Oh. I have to interrogate Gemma and find out. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, there was... Uh, Desmond's shop. Desmond had Mount Street. Uh, not uh, well. Mount Street was the original one, and then he had another shop on Piccadilly, of course opposite did. Green Park. Well, now it's being redeveloped area. next to In and Out, the original In and Out Club right. next to there. And it, matter of fact, it was such a lovely shop. Now they're redeveloping the whole corner, and yet that bit of the facade had to be kept. So it was preserved, protected, and now they're slowly taking it off. That little bit is kept as it was. Very I took cool. a picture of it and sent to Desmond's wife, Pamela. Oh, very nice. Yeah. But back in, in those days, Desmond was mainly in the pipe business, wasn't he? He was bigger than well, the pipe and business. Yes, uh, he was the largest pipe dealer, especially. He specialized mainly in, um, as they call it, state pipes, sort right. of secondhand pipes sure. where people would have smoked it and had it matured and ready to be enjoyed by the next generation. He was a so most astute tobacconist. He knew the market back to front. He was in and out, pipes at the right time, cigars at the right time. A very, very clever man. Brilliant he, cigar merchant. He was a lovely man. He was my dearest friend. Uh, not I only the tobacco the trade, but the whole of here. Too. We used to always travel together. We used to, he was, uh, they say, you find out how good of a friend is when you travel with him or when you gamble with him. Well, <laughs> Desmond and I, we never gambled, but we traveled a lot and he was such a lovely traveling companion. Well, that reminds me, I think the first time we were in Havana together on a Hunters and Franco trip, which was probably 99, maybe 2000, dreadfully long flight arrived, Hunters and Franco coach picked us up and I said to you, oh, I can't wait to have a smoke. And you pulled out a Davidoff pulled out your little torch in the car in, in, in the, the bus and took it up and I was like oh I've arrived fantastic in fact that's that yeah that's an early memory but I always wanted to be in St James's but could never find the right property or could never afford it so it was great to actually finally arrive a year and a half ago I think um roughly yeah a year and a half ago that's gone quick um because, yeah, this really is, as I said, it's cigar land and it's nice to be able to hang out because St. James is a great area, great restaurants, great clubs, great well, cigar well, retailers. Well, the yes. clubs, the clubs in particular, the gentlemen's clubs, I mean, you're surrounded, we're, surrounded we're all by surrounded. Them, most of them have fabulous terraces yes. or... Well, they uh, didn't, none areas. of them did, apart from uh, Boodles. Nobody else had it. Since the band came in, they started creating these... Clubs. Now Carlton Club has got a smoking terrace, yeah. uh, White still doesn't, I know they're trying arts to club. work in the Arts Club. Very lovely, yeah. upstairs yeah, the, the new in and out club, outside the yeah. beautiful smoking area. Yeah, London is very cigar friendly generally, I mean we don't have the best weather although it has brightened up a bit today, um, but at least you can find somewhere relatively covered, heated um, these days that you can sample or smoke in. More or less every month of the year, thankfully. And it's gone full circle, no? Uh, I mean, we had that lovely boom in the 90s. Then things really seemed to quieten down in terms of general public's awareness and enjoyment of cigars. 
And now we're back, no? Now we're back with the boom. Yeah, this yeah. is, yeah, this is the boom. Because boom we've seen since the late 90s for sure. Uh, you youngsters enjoy it. Hopefully, it will <laughs> long may it continue. There's a different, different generation, generation smoking now, completely, isn't it? The whole demographic has changed. The cigar smoker's profile um, has changed dramatically. I think probably our target age group is about 20 to 30 now, whereas when I started in the business, what, 28, 29 years ago, I'd say the average age of one of my clients would be about 60 to 70. So it's got younger and younger through the years. Now we're old, Eddie. <laughs> you're, you're still. We're, 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 we're mature, still, according to cigar. Yeah. Young boys, you are in comparison to me, but enjoy. The years will buy, go by so quickly that you won't know where it went. That's for sure. So you know, I have to say, Mitchell, when I came back into the business, I, you know, what I was, was that? well, I was working with my father in in the mid '90s for for a few years. Um, as a punishment, truthfully, because I was messing around at university, not studying. So I owed him a lot of school fees. <laughs> uh, he brought me back on a very low wage and said, you work here. But luckily, it was when the cigar boom was happening with Cigar Aficionado. Uh, and then I went, left the industry, went to the city, came back in 2008, not on purpose. You know, the job ended in the city and dad said, well, can you give me a hand while you look for another job? And thank God he did. Um, and this time round, when I came back in, the first most amazing thing I discovered was your auctions and your business online. I have to say, I, I was so surprised in such an old-fashioned business to find someone like yourself, very visionary, doing things online, you know, sharing information, which again, my hat's off to you. Thank People you. used to keep everything very close to their chests. Yeah, I'm the opposite. Yeah, and, and it's worked not just to your advantage, all of us to open the market um, so again my compliments and, and I've been admiring your business Thank you. uh, as I came back into dad's well I, I had a different take on on business generally from the start in the cigar business um, a I wanted to give a level of service and choice and value that I never saw in the UK cigar industry generally in that time era which is sort of um, mid 90s and I wanted to make cigars very accessible with rapid delivery it was a complete you know it was revolutionary it wasn't it hadn't been done before in that way because of the internet you know we were first in um so we were sort of disruptors and game changers but then as time went on i couldn't quite understand why all the cigar merchants didn't work together loosely to help each other um you know, if one, if one merchant had stock of something and another didn't, I didn't understand why there wasn't cooperation. And I tried to get that message across to people over the years. Very few picked up on the message. You did. We all. I had a box you need, have it. You got a box I need, have it. I got a client here, even you know, a few weeks, months, client here. We haven't got exactly what he's looking for. We send them up to you, vice versa, because we always figured it's good for everybody that way. Clients share stocks. Everybody does more business. The customer gets a better service. Very few people got it, but you, you guys got it straight away, which was great. So we've always worked very nicely, very closely together. And of course, you've been hugely, hugely helpful to me when there's been authentication questions on auction boxes. And I've had to zip round to you and say, I can't call it on this one. Let's look at it together. And of course, you've you know been amazing and run down to your humidor, come up with another five, ten examples, and then between us, we sort of crunch the facts and, and make a judgment call on it that we're taking the box for auction or, or we're returning it. So thank thank you for all your help with that. But you know, on, on the information side and the auction side, yeah, we we we, we were um, again a bit of a game changer on that too make the regular auctions and then to migrate from um, in-room auctions to online auctions purely. And the important thing for us was, again, to give the, the auction bidder, the consumer, information, facts and resource. Hence, we, put, we leave all the sold data for the lots online since, I don't know, uh, about 2011. So there's tons of sold data. You just put in the search bar the name of the cigar and it'll bring up every sold price. So you can get a steer on what are your cigars worth? What were they worth? What's been the growth pattern? Or in some cases, no growth pattern. But, you know, that's a service to the cigar buyer. And collector. it's frightening sometimes to see those it, amounts. It's very frightening. <laughs> I mean, so, some of the prices are quite startling. Oh, yeah. 
Um, well, yeah. I think it's more than the, the, the customer that's benefited from that. I would challenge even the merchants that uh, pretend they don't look. I think everyone, including us, regularly looks at your website, your auction site, because, you know, I don't know. If I have a box, I think it's worth X. I Best will look shame. at yours. Absolutely. If you've sold it for more, I'll... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's good market data. It, it can't be used in isolation because you can have, one, you can have the same box um, in two auctions three months apart and the price can go down because you might find there's only two bidders that are after that particular box and they're going crazy bidding. When it comes to the next auction, they just aren't the same bidders and the same level of interest. But nevertheless, it, it's a good resource and it's a fun resource for people, I think. But so. it's a very reliable source, your source, because I... I very regularly to our customers that they walk in with a box of cigar. I have this, belong to my father or grandfather, or found it in the basement. Uh, how much is it worth? What can I do with it? I said, well, you don't have to go too far now. Just walk down, so <coughs> make a left turn, take it there, show it to them. They'll give you all the information. This is the online if you want to check it online and take it on from there, which is wonderful. Glad it's, it's working yeah. in that case. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. It took a lot of development. <laughs> but, but Mitchell, it must be tempting for you when you see these amazing boxes coming through for auction, it must be tempting as a, as, a, as a cigar lover yourself and a merchant to say, actually, I'll buy it. Can't, Can't buy, buy everything. We no, traders. that's true, as much as we'd <laughs> like to. I'm sort of the curator of the collection because obviously we deal with vintage cigars like yourselves all year round. But we tend to look at them and love them for a period of time and then sell them. It might be because the time is just right to sell them or we feel they've peaked in value or we feel our inventory is too high at that stage but you know we don't keep a vast collection forever as much as i've dealt with like yourselves some of the most unbelievable rare boxes and beautiful boxes some of the pre-embargo boxes that we've come across have been astonishing and it, i'd like to say it hurts to part with them but it doesn't really because you can't keep everything because we are, at the end of the day, cigar merchants. Yes, exactly. There's so much you can keep. Absolutely. Yes. yes. And it's, it's funny, funny looking back, back on the prices. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but also, you know, it's a, it's a consumer product. You know, we're selling experiences. I mean, we all know that. We're selling pleasure. And it would be unfair if we were hoarding all that pleasure, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It must be too tempting to smoke them. No. I remember, I think it was on my 40th birthday, I smoked through a box of, a box of pre embargo Particus Idealis with a bunch of my friends in the, in, the, in the Seagull's office. And that spoiled me because it doesn't, it doesn't get any better than that as far as I'm concerned. They were like in perfect condition, perfect appearance, most unbelievable cigars. So where do you go from there? You know, you have to bring yourself back to earth and say, aged cigars are a treat. But I smoke regular Havana cigars. A few weeks ago, it was Eddie's 50th birthday. And among my cigars... Uh, 49, I, please. No, no, it was 50. <laughs> <laughs> I found a cigar. Not I found it. It was never lost. It was there. I had a cigar from my very old collection. I used to buy from Dunhills in the 70s. And this was uh, Don Candido 500, the oh, Churchill beautiful. size. Yeah. I used to buy them in boxes of 100. They came in 100 boxes. Yeah. I still have a few left. And 50s and 25. <laughs> yeah, but I used to get the 100 box. Yeah. I loved the 100 boxes. It was like a chest, you open sure. it, and it. And one of them, I kept it in a tube. And I said, I'll, I'll smoke it a couple of years ago. I said, no, I'll keep it. And then I thought, maybe perhaps for Eddie's, when he's 50, this was a few years gone. And it just stayed there. It went from my traveling bag into my drawer, and then from my drawer into my traveling bag. But it never parted. It was always there with me. It was my, uh, there's an island cigar perhaps, just in case. <laughs> and then we were in, in a lovely island in Greece celebrating Eddie's 50th birthday. I got that cigar out. I said, Eddie, this cigar is, is as old as yours, 50 years old. Amazing. How was it? We'll ask well, him. He smoked it. Beautiful. <laughs> Mitchell, I smoked it on the day. Dad gave it to me. I couldn't believe it. And, well, as you know, with 50-year-old cigars, sometimes they can be very flat. This had all the development you could ever wish for, the flavor, the strength. It had everything. I mean, I put it down. I'm spoiled now, you know. I'm like, what? Well, how am I ever going to follow up on this? Yeah. It was beautiful. 
Well, let's do desert island cigars. Top three cigars. You're on a desert island. Got to give them in, in order as well. Um, so if there was only one that you could have and then the, the next, next two. two. Okay, so can I ask a, a refining question? Yeah. Can I travel in time to pick out the cigar I want? Yes. Okay. Easy. Well, maybe yes and no. That's a very good one, isn't it? Because that gives you too much choice. If I could travel in time, it yeah. would be a relatively mature five to ten year Dom Perignon. Beautiful. In its heyday, just gorgeous. Yeah. I wouldn't give the same answer now because most of the DPs I've smoked now, a little too light for my palate. Yeah. If it's a current cigar, oh, that's a really good question. I, I, I mean, I would be cheesy and say the Siglo 6 Grand Reserva. Uh, I've always loved that. Um, more recently, dare I say it, La Reina or a Fundadores from El Aguito production, early Not gold yet. band. Oh, those would be mine. <laughs> Fine, I've noted that down if I find you on a desert <laughs> island ever. Edward, top three, you're on a desert island. Desert island. I'm allowed to take a box or a single cigar? Oh, it's a never ending supply because you're stuck on that desert island. So you have to choose what they're going to drop into the island for you. If I had to choose it today, and I'm going to the desert island tomorrow, I would probably take a Lancero. Cohiba. Cohiba Lancero. Despite some of the difficulty on drawing, I still like the challenge. And there is a good reason, because the way I smoke the Lancero, it's no secret now, everybody knows. In the morning, I cut one third of it off in the morning, and I have it with my coffee. And then the remaining two thirds in the afternoon. That would be my tomorrow cigar. If it's going to be in a few years down the road, then it will be the La Reina. At the moment, I'm finding the La Reina not ready to smoke. When it came out, it was delicious. And now it's going down. Uh, it needs time to rest. Okay. Going through a flat period. A flat period. I, I suggest you sell this to your son because <laughs> he has a different opinion. No, you know, I never sell anything. They're very much this is going, it's following the same pattern as the David of Number Ones did. They were delicious, and then for a number of years, maybe seven, eight, ten years, it, it just reached the stage where it was hot smoke. Yeah. And then 15 years later, it came, it back. came back with a vengeance. Absolutely. I think the the same is happening with the Larenas. Interesting, interesting. Okay. What about you, Mitchell? Oh, um, um, mine would be a 2007 Bolivar Bellicosos with a TEB factory code, um, preferably June 07. Um, for me, that was the most magical year, perfect factory and date code, and I love Bolivar Bellicosos. Do you know what it was? Do you know what the factory was? Um, oh. I did. And now I can't remember. I think it was. Um, Not the no, I think it was La Corona. Oh. Oh, I can't remember. I've got it in my notes. You see, I'm forgetting everything as well. I'm so old. Oh, don't say that. You're far too young to say that. You can't get away with that excuse. <laughs> so tell me, um, you can have a cigar of your choice with any three people, dead or alive. Who would you choose? Three people that I would like to smoke cigar. The live ones, it's easy. Any dear friend, or even a stranger who enjoys a good cigar, I would enjoy sitting and smoking. But if I have to go back and smoke a cigar with my departed friends, there are three names I have to put together. Zeno Davidov, I always enjoyed smoking a cigar in his presence with him. Simon Chase, of course. It was an education every time we smoked a cigar together. And Desmond Souter, my dear friend. Fair enough. These three. Three good choices for sure. Yeah. Eddie? Well, you, you've taken the industry, so I'll, I'll, I'll step to the left of that. Uh, those who aren't with us anymore, do they have to be cigar smokers necessarily? Yeah, probably. Okay, so Marilyn Monroe's out. <laughs> uh, I, I would love to have Winston Churchill there. He was on my list. Ah, uh, my, my apologies. He's all the goodies. <laughs> um, 
I have to say, Nick Freeman, uh, Gemma's father, there's a lot of questions I have for him, especially about what dad got up to in the early years. So I would include Nick in that. Okay. Um, and hey, Fidel, I mean, who else? Fidel Castro, I mean, what a gold mine of, of conversation and well, knowledge. Well, he'd bore you to death, death by talking, talking for about That's five true. Hours. <laughs> about three cigars with him. <laughs> Sorry to say. What about you, Mitchell? Um, well, uh, living um, without any shadow of a doubt, my favourite person to have a cigar with is my father. No one comes close, sorry to say. Um, and I, I would agree with you, Simon Chase, without a doubt. Had some great times with him over some great cigars. Um, he was a walking, talking encyclopaedia and I just loved his company. Amazing man. Um, Zeno would have been a dream to have a cigar with. Um, and, and my two late grandfathers, that's a bit of a mush of living and not living. So yeah, they would be my choices, I would say. But let's get back to St. James's Street, lovely St. James's. So we, we opened up at probably the worst time in the history of the cigar business, just at the start of one of the lockdowns. I've lost count which one it was. And I don't think we saw a customer in the first, don't know how long. In fact, I don't think we saw a human being on St. James's Street. There was hardly anybody in the street. Whereas it's usually a sea of people, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 Not even a car. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, it yeah. used to take me about eighteen minutes from my home in North London <laughs> to drive here. So on the bloody car on the road, unbelievable. Uh, but it's back to normal now, very back to normal, um, and, and it's busier than ever. It's it's beyond normal. It's uh, and the tourists are back. Tourists yes, are back, big time in hordes, which is lovely. It's wonderful. Americans, Chinese. Not everybody is a smoker, Chinese. however. You know the good thing about the people who are coming back now is they're coming at, uh, coming up with four armed and well self-educated because of the having to stay home they were watching a lot of mm. contents on Netflix. Uh, sort of the media mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they come uh, saying uh, they're probably some of them come uh, more knowledgeable than I am you know very precise I want this particular cigar, I want that, I want the color to be that, I, I want it to... I mean, they go into such detail, they sort of, uh, <laughs> hands up, let me show you what we have. Uh, it's definitely getting uh, busier, and customers are more educated, younger for sure. We're getting many, many youngsters coming, uh, finding out the pleasures of enjoying a good cigar. Uh, St. James as well has changed a lot. Well, we've got all the outside seating up and down the street now, which is great. And of course, we've had a fabulous summer, so they're buying cigars from our stores and JJ's and Cigar Exchange and sitting outside the stores or in Franco's, which is super cigar friendly. Um, or is it Murano? Lovely there. I mean, it's just so much. Or just outside your shop here. Just outside, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, there was a time, uh, not all that long ago, the only place where you could sit outside and smoke a cigar was Franco's. Yeah, absolutely. That's all for years and years. Yeah, that's, that's so, all so it was. One benefit of the lockdown. Yes. Coming out of the lockdown. Yes, yes. Westminster realized that the benefits and the joys of having seats outside for establishment. For sure. Becomes a bit more, I don't know, sort of cafe society, a bit more. Um, how it was maybe years ago or, or how it is on the continent. Far better. Very civilised, sit outside, eat, drink, smoke. It's a very good sociable weather. thing to do as well. The amount of people who s start chatting each other up, talking to each other, just because they're smoking cigars. Sure. Well, we're a friendly bunch, us cigar smokers. If you see somebody, you just start talking. It's great. It's I always say the cigar is the instrument of friendship and pleasure. And that's what it is. Okay. I mean, here we are sitting here chatting to. Why? Because of the cigar. The cigar has brought all of us together. A, a, a thought, really, and a question. You know, I've always pondered St. James's. It's, it's, it's a small bit of London. It's very close to Bond Street, just off Piccadilly, all of these you know, seas of people and crowds and tourists and so on. And yet, 30, 20, 30, 40 meters away from probably one of the busiest thoroughfares of, of people and tourists, which is Piccadilly, yeah. you have St. James's. 
and you, there's a unique personality, a unique shopper, a unique visitor that comes to our area. Of course, I'd love to say it's because we're here, well, i.e. No, all of us, mm -hmm. but it's not just us. It's, I think, unintentionally perhaps, maybe intentionally, the, the tenant mix of St. James's and German Street is individual, is specialists. It's people with a passion for, for something really more than the basic. It's for the luxury craft. Yeah. And, and people come here and I think they, they thrive and feed off that. We're so lucky to be part of that little, little neighborhood. It's only a tiny little bit of London. I struggle to think of other places either in London or in the world where you can have that quality of shopping um, without the masses, without the crowds, without the craziness. I, I actually can't think of anywhere. I think it's quite unique. Yeah. And it's fascinating to me because we've got, as you know, a very, very busy cigar store in Mayfair on Shepherd Market. Super busy, fabulous, busy, buzzy area. I don't think it's a one mile walk from here. And yet the customer demographic is utterly, utterly different, completely different. And, and, and the Mayfair customers stay in Mayfair, and the St. St. James's customers don't go over to Mayfair, they stay in St. James's. But it's so close, and yet a completely different clientele. Fascinating to me. Anyway, um, it's a hell of an area. Very, very cool area. Very, yeah, very classy. As you say, niche, um, high-class retailers. Um, so it brings, yeah, it brings a different sort of clientele. Yeah, most of us are still run by the proprietors which makes a big difference. And somebody walking in here, seeing you sitting here, makes all the difference. Definitely. Makes it personal. No multiples, although we are multiple, I you, 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 <laughs> don't, you don't get that feeling walking into Gucci <laughs> just on the other side of the street, do you? No, if they let you walk in. No, Gucci's no problem. Louis Vuitton, that's a big problem. They come, come with a clipboard and take your name and say, mm. we'll serve you in half an hour. Mm. Can you imagine me saying that to my customers? <laughs> <laughs> they got the road to you instead. I really hope that ends. Um, you know, this, uh, as a consumer, and I'm on both sides of the till, and I cannot tell you how upsetting it is to me when several things. One, these shops treat customers like a you know, checkboard commodity. Have you spent enough with us yeah. to, for us to allow you to buy something? And two, the, the, the idea that customer service is secondary to the value of the brand yeah and you know you get mistreated nowadays post pandemic for me when you walk into a shop and they say we're cash only i mean uh, sorry cashless only how how can you even begin to presuppose what your customer wants to do i don't know and they're doing it more that's not customer service that's for sure but we're an old-fashioned business our industry generally because we've been here hundreds of years, if you think about it. I mean, our, our retail division celebrated 205 years in business. I don't know many industries or businesses that have survived 205 years, which is quite fascinating. fascinating. Well, John Loeb and Lox down the road have. Very old. <laughs> and Barry Brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's nice to see you again um, as my local neighbours. And uh, it's been fun talking, as ever, and enjoying a cigar. What, what are you smoking? So this is the punch, short to punch from your lovely humidor, my compliments. It is delicious. Excellent. That's a good recommendation. Edward? Uh, well, I was offered, and I asked for it, the Monte Cristo Special Number no. 2. Ah, very nice. Very elegant. Surprisingly, not surprisingly, because sometimes, again, it's a size that you might have a difficulty on drawing on. Oh, this is just... Perfect. Glad to hear. It is lovely. It is delicious. Thank you very much for having hey, We're something right in our little humidor. That's good. And I was smoking, I think, a Ramon Superioris from our La Casa del Habano range. Not my usual smoke, but actually very, very good. I think that's a finger burner. Um, but no, great to catch up. Uh, lots of stories, lots of years have gone past. Hopefully we'll look forward to another 25 years of being neighbours at the very least. At the very and create lots more stories and lots more memories. I should be watching both of you from up yeah, there, you're you know. Going nowhere. You're going nowhere. <laughs> yeah, well said. Um, Hopefully, our, our, our viewers have enjoyed, but let us know. <laughs> like, subscribe, and share. That was a joke. My daughter always tells me to say that. <laughs> you can do that as an outtake. <laughs> Alrighty. Um,
Mitchell, thank you very much for inviting us here. Pleasure. And Thanks let me all. repeat again, it's such a joy and a pleasure having you amongst us as a neighbor. Thank My you. father used to say, a good neighbor is God's blessing. And we're blessed with your being our neighbor here. I feel the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.